So hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. And many thanks to KubeCon and CloudNativeCon for having us. We're really excited to be here. In our session today, we're going to be covering an introduction to Kubernetes, GitOps, and observability. We're going to start out with a few introductory slides before moving on to the hands-on tutorial portion of our session today. I'd like to kindly ask you to ask questions in chat, and we will be having a dedicated Q&A session following the workshop. Um, and to get us started, um, I'd like to invite Joaquin to introduce himself briefly. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Joaquin Rodriguez. Uh, I work for Microsoft uh, on their commercial software engineering. Um, I, um, I guess, help customers uh, with Kubernetes and open source. Uh, happy to be here. I'm based in Austin, Texas. Um, yeah, again, thanks for having us. And I'm Tiffany Wang. I'm a solutions architect on the customer success team at Weaveworks. And I'm originally from Southern California, and I'm now based in London. And like Joaquin, I work with customers to streamline delivery and deployment to Kubernetes clusters, both on-premise and in public cloud, following GitOps. So before we continue on with the introductory slides, I'd like to invite you all to register for the hands-on section of our session today. Um, if you could please navigate to HTTPS cube101.dev. Um, the username and password are displayed on the screen and hopefully might be available somewhere in chat. But um, if it's helpful, the username is cube and the password is capital V at symbol Lencia 22 exclamation point. And um, once you've um, conducted the basic auth to the registration page, you'll need to register with your GitHub username. Once you've registered, you should check your email for a uh, email invitation to the Kubernetes 101 GitHub org. We'll be using the KubeCon 2022 repository um, for our GitHub code spaces, which is where we're going to be conducting the workshop today. So uh, take a minute to uh, take note of the username and password um, and I will be moving on from this slide, um, but we have a wonderful moderator that hopefully you got the username and password. Awesome. Great. So while I give you a few minutes to do that, I'll begin with an introduction to Kubernetes. Since you're all here at KubeCon, this is information that you probably already know, but we can start from the very beginning and uh, talk about how Kubernetes is an open source cloud native computing foundation project for container orchestration. It was initially created at Google, and now it is maintained by CNCF. Kubernetes allows you to define declarative configuration to manage containerized workloads and services. And Kubernetes is cloud native. It's highly distributed, resilient to infrastructure failure and outages, enables uh, frequent releases, and it provides automa automation and observability self-healing and horizontal scaling, service discovery and load balancing, and it is scalable. It's capable of running on-premises and in public cloud or a mix of both. So you can have a um, similar deployment experience regardless of target cloud, cloud provider. On this slide, there are a bunch of components, but these components are what allows your Kubernetes clusters to work. On the left-hand side, you'll see the control plane elements. And the control plane elements um, typically run on control plane nodes. The control plane components include the API server, which allows users to interact with Kubernetes API server, and it validates and configures data for Kubernetes objects. We also have the controller manager, which manages processes for nodes, jobs, endpoints, and many others. We also have etcd, which is the backing store for your cluster's state. We have the scheduler, which determines where workloads should run in your cluster. And we also have an additional cloud controller manager, which handles any cloud provider specific logic. On the right, we have three worker nodes, and worker nodes are typically where your workloads will get scheduled to run. Some key components of the nodes include the kubelet, 
which manages containers created by Kubernetes, as well as makes sure that they, your containers run in pods and that they come up successfully. We also have the Kube proxy, which manages the network rules for your internal and external communications for your cluster. We'll go into a little more detail about Kubernetes resources and the Kube API server to understand how Kubernetes resources are grouped and managed. There are a lot of Kubernetes resources, and they're grouped by their primary function. As an example, we have groups that manage, uh, that include role-based access control resources, scheduling, admission registration, auto-scaling, events, and many more. But today in our workshop, we're going to be focusing on the core API group objects. Uh, that is resources in the core and apps API groups. Some of these resources include namespaces, deployments, services, secrets, and the API server allows us to create, read, update, and destroy these resources. You can extend the Kubernetes API by defining custom resource definitions, which co Kubernetes controllers know how to interact with. We're going to be using Flux in our workshop today, and that's a great way to explain and see one in action. It's really important to understand that all of the Kubernetes resources are declaratively defined using YAML. The declarative definition of resources helps to simplify some of the complex processes that happen within the cluster. So how do all of these work resources work together and eventually express an application that end users will use? This slide highlights some of the components and we can actually start from the innermost part, which is the container. Now, a container is an immutable copy of your application code and all of its dependencies, and it runs within a pod. A pod is the smallest deployable unit in Kubernetes, and it can include one or multiple containers. Containers within a pod share a network namespace, and the pod is ephemeral, it's assigned an IP, and you can add metadata to it like labels. While you can technically deploy a pod by itself, it's recommended that you instead define a deployment, or if you're running stateful workloads, a stateful set. Um, and a deployment allows you to specify the number of replicas that you'd like to have running in your cluster. Now, if you have a deployment with n number of pods, each with its own IP, you can define a service that maps to the deployment. The service then gets a virtual IP, it's mapped to endpoints via labels, and it is also named in DNS. The service and the deployment both run within a namespace, which itself is another Kubernetes resource. Namespaces provide an opportunity to logically group your resources. So Kubernetes does a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to creating your resources and scheduling them, but there are a lot of resources to manage, especially in a you know, microservice architecture. Um, and we need a way to reproduce um, what we've deployed to our clusters. And we need to also understand conclusively what it is that should be running in our cluster. And for this, we look to GitOps. On this page are the open GitOps principles that are, uh, or rather the GitOps principles that are managed by the open GitOps group. This is an open group, so if you're interested in becoming more involved, um, we invite you to join. GitOps builds on DevOps and infrastructure as code, by, and by adhering to these principles, you're able to empower developers by improving productivity, improving stability and reliability, and enforcing consistency and security. The GitOps principles then require that one, your entire system state is declaratively defined. Two, your desired state should be stored and versioned and immutable. Git lends itself really well to this and also allows developers to stay in the workflows that they know best. Three, Software agents, like Flux, um, should continuously pull from the desired state. And four, software agents should continuously reconcile 
um, the contents of the desired state to your running cluster. So if you're new to GitOps and you are thinking about all the benefits that it can bring, um, and you're wondering if you have to scrap everything it is that you've built so far, and the answer is absolutely not. On the left-hand side, you'll see a continuous integration workflow that starts with a developer writing application code, subsequently building and testing that code, and the CI workflow culminates in an immutable artifact, whether that's an image or a Helm chart. And then on the right-hand side, we have the Kubernetes and GitOps workflow. This is also centered around Git, but this time for your declaratively defined desired state. GitOps allows you to streamline deployments to your clusters, observability within your cluster, and operations for your cluster. If you treat Git as your single source of truth, then any changes that you seek to make to your cluster should be made via, via pull request. And this allows you to easily see um, the difference between what's running in your cluster and what you're defining as desired state. And software agents like Flux automatically reconcile the two. This gives you an inherent audit trail. Um, and you will know exactly who made what ch change when, and if the commit messages are good, also why. GitOps also allows you to um, easily roll back to last known good state. It's as easy as a revert or a fix forward commit. So Weaver's actually coined the term GitOps, um, and today technology um, has advanced to the point where it, it's, no, it's not required that you use Git, but some other um, source uh, control versioning system. Um, but that is where the term came from. So GitOps is the practice of using Git to store declaratively defined desired state and continuous delivery agents like Flux to automate the reconciliation of current state to desired state. With GitOps, CI and CD are effectively decoupled. So GitOps itself is agnostic to tooling, but in today's workshop, we're going to be using Flux, which is an open source CNCF project created at Weaveworks, and Flux's runtime is comprised of several Kubernetes controllers, as well as their corresponding CRDs. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on the source controller and the customized controller. The Flux source controller interacts with custom resources like Git repositories, buckets, Helm repositories, and Helm charts. And in today's workshop, we're gonna be focusing on the Git repository. A Flux Git repository allows Flux to know which repository it is you want it to monitor and pull from, as well as the branch. There are some additional fields that we'll be covering in the hands-on section of the workshop as well. We're also going to be using the customized controller, which, uh, whose corresponding CRD is the customization. Um, and the customization custom resource allows you to tell Flux the path within the specified Git repository in our workshop today um, that Flux should read pull resources from and reconcile to your running cluster. Flux is able to keep your Kubernetes in sync with what you've defined in Git, um, and it automatically and continuously reconciles running state to desired state. So now we've got Kubernetes that easily allows us to declaratively define our resources that comprise our applications, and we've got GitOps to streamline the operations by which they get deployed to the cluster. We need a way to easily understand the goings on within the cluster, and we can accomplish this with observability. Monitoring and observability go hand in hand, where observability is arguably the superset. Observability allows you to inspect, observe, explore, trace, and create custom queries to understand how your system is performing. With monitoring, the metrics, alerts, and dashboards that you set up should be actionable. 
There are a lot of tools that accomplish things like metrics, logging, and tracing, but today we're going to be using Prometheus for metrics collection, and Prometheus is an open source CNCF project created by SoundCloud, um, and it stores your metrics in a time as time series data. We're going to be using Grafana for um, visualizing our metrics, and Grafana was created by Grafana Labs. Finally, we're going to be using Fluentbit for log ag logs and metrics processing and forwarding. And Fluentbit is under the FluentD umbrella created by tre oops, Treasure Data, um, and it is also a C CNCF project. So now that we've covered Kubernetes, GitOps, and observability, let's dive into the hands-on tutorial and see it all in action. And I will hand over to Joaquin to get us started. Thank you, Tiffany. Uh, can everybody hear me fine? OK. So um, yeah, so let's get started. Um, like we mentioned before, in order to, if, if you choose to participate in the, in the hands-on tutorial, uh, you need to join uh, the GitHub org. Uh, today, we'll be using uh, GitHub Code Spaces as our platform uh, for development. Um, so if you wish to participate, uh, make sure you're part of the org, uh, the username and password in case for those who join late, uh, it's right here. Let me see if I can find it. That's the username and password and you have to go to coop101.dev to register. You should get an email uh, with an invitation and once uh, you join, you have access to code spaces. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so the first thing, Sorry, what? Do you want to create your code space? Yeah. So the first thing that we're going to do to get started, um, you're going to see a little green button up here called code, and then you're going to click, uh, click on create a code space on main. Hopefully the Wi-Fi is, is nice right now. It's really poor? OK. So. Um, how many people have um, registered to the org successfully, at least? Okay. Okay. Once, I mean, hopefully once this starts, um, we should be good to go. It's just like this first piece that, you know, it, since the wife is a little poor, uh, hopefully we should be good. <laughs> Just by the show of hands, was anybody able to create a code space? Okay, we have a few. Okay, that's awesome. Well, I think Tiffany had a backup code space already open, so I'm yes. gonna just. Give me one sec. Yeah, let's do that. And by the way, if you fall behind or if it takes a little while, all the instructions are um, on the README, so don't worry about it. Like everything that we're gonna be showing, it's all documented, so. Don't stress about it if your code space doesn't load uh, yet, so. <laughs> yep. Okay, so this one is coming up. Okay. So essentially we have a pre-built image for code spaces that um, we have everything that we need in there. So it's pretty cool because once you create your code space, um, we're gonna have a K3D cluster, we're gonna have all the deployment YAMLs that we need. Um, we have some uh, CLI tools already uh, pre-installed. So it's kind of nice as a you know, development uh, environment. This is not meant for production. Uh, we mostly use it for inner loop development and testing and demos like, like this. So, uh, okay, so it seems like it's coming up, so that's great. Show of hands now for how many people have their code spaces up. Okay. 
We're right there with the rest of you who haven't risen your hands yet. the demo gods are not being friendly today. <laughs> the Wi-Fi gods. The Wi-Fi gods, right. <laughs> okay, what about the other one? Yeah, the same thing. Let's see which one comes up first. <laughs> Maybe while we wait for this, we can start by um, going through the README. Yeah, or I was thinking that I can connect to my computer on a hotspot and then just, uh, just do that. Okay. Yeah, let me tell I'm, I'm going to see if I can connect to my computer via the hotspot and see if that helps a little bit. So let me do that really quick. Give me one second. I apologize for the inconvenience. Tips for Will you get it now? Oh. Wi-Fi is gone. Wi-Fi is gone. <laughs> is it really? You don't have any Wi-Fi? Yeah, I cannot connect either here. Okay, so, so should we do with Plan B? Yeah. Okay. So we have somewhat of a contingency plan, um, um, and hopefully. <laughs> Uh, thank you all very much for your patience, and um, we'll keep an eye on our code spaces um, periodically. But we have recorded a screen recording um, of what it should look like if we had Wi Fi. <laughs> um, but once you get back to your hotel and you log in, you should be able to do all this. Um, you know, pre exactly. we, we tested it like so many times, so it's yep. just the Wi Fi. Okay. <laughs> And um, all of the commands are included in the README, along with some descriptions of the significance of each step. So um, bear with us. We're going to be playing the recording and um, pausing as um, required for us to explain some of what's happening. OK. So like I was saying, I created the code space. Um, typically, it takes like 45 seconds for the environment to get up and ready. Uh, it's pulling an image. And with this image, like I said, you know, it creates a Kubernetes cluster for us. And it also gives us um, all the tools that we need out of the box, right? We have uh, the YAMLs for deploying the applications that we need. Uh, we have some CLI tools. Um, what else do we like have? Like Flux. Like Flux, for example. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so it takes like 45 minutes, uh, 45 seconds to uh, get started. Um, so you can see we downloaded the image, the container is getting built, and now it got created. Okay. So now, okay. Sorry. 
Let's see. Wi-Fi? Yeah. Okay, we have internet now, so this will work. ¿Dónde está este? Este. Okay. Okay, gracias. Okay. So let's test this really quick, and hopefully, hopefully, hopefully it'll work. I'm gonna make sure I'm on the internet. Not yet. See if this helps. Here, let me know. Can you do it? Yep. Okay. Okay. Seems like like we're in business. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> and again, you'll be able to run this for yourselves. Um, you know, back at your hotels or when the Wi-Fi um, is a little more stable. Um, and thanks again for your patience. Okay, so now let's get started. All right, so uh, it's like I was saying, you know, we created the code space. Um, and the first thing that like, I wanted to show you is that here out of the box, we have a K3D cluster. Uh, K3D uh, is a lightweight, uh, single node Kubernetes cluster. Uh, essentially, it's a wrapper uh, for K3S. And it runs as a Docker container. That's, what we, that's how we were running it. And just out of the box, if you run uh, kubectl get all, uh, get us to get all the resources, and a dash capital A is mean, meaning that we want to check out across all namespaces. So as you can see, we have different resources that are already created by uh, default. We don't have any of our resources, which uh, involves you know observability and flux and our custom application. That's not deployed yet, and that's what we're going to be doing first. Um, likewise, uh, if I run uh, kubectl get pods, I'm able to see all the pods uh, available on the cluster. And is that too small? Should I zoom in a little bit? Let's see. A little better, right? Okay. Capital A. So something that I want to note is that by... Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, that out of the box, we have some uh, port forwards defined. So uh, these are defined. If you click on their ports, you can see here we have you know, Prometheus, and port uh, 30,000, IMDB, Heartbeat, Grafana, et cetera. So we have these out of the box. That way, whenever we want to connect to these services, uh, we're able to you know, connect to them. But right now, since we have not deployed the application yet, we are not able to connect to them yet. So. I just wanted to know that really quick. But OK, so let's get started. So the first thing that we're going to do, we're going to deploy an application called IMDB. Uh, IMDB, uh, essentially, it's an application written in .NET. Uh, it's been containerized in an image. And we're going to be deploying it um, to our Kubernetes cluster. Uh, this application uh, essentially runs a in-memory movie database, and it, it accepts different requests, right? Like you know, get and post, etc. And, and we're going to be using that as our sample application for today's workshop. So, the first thing that we want to do to get this deployed, uh, we created a workshop manifest folder. So we're going to cd into it. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a namespace. So our resources need a place to live. So for that, we have a namespace. Um, and like I noted here on the notes, uh, in Kubernetes namespace provides a mechanism for isolating groups of resources within a single uh, cluster. And the name of uh, resources need to be unique within a namespace, but not across uh, different namespace. So in order to... Oh. IMDB folder. Oh, yes, thank you. And we're going to go to IMDB. Okay. So in order to create the namespace, we're going to do kubectl apply dash f, which the f is for, uh, you know, for file. And I'm going to apply the 01 namespace. And just like that, you can see that our namespace was created. 
And if I go, if I just want to take a look at that YAML under the namespace YAML file, uh, it's very simple. Uh, all it is is, hey, Kubernetes, I want you to create something of the kind namespace, and I want you to name it IMDB. Pretty straightforward. Um, and as you can see, if I do kubectl, get ns. Oh, by the way, um, for kubectl, there's a lot of different pronunciations for that. Some people say kubectl or kubectl. Uh, so you might hear a little bit of everything. I think Tiffany says uh, kubectl. <laughs> so I think there's like a YouTube video out there that talks about all the pronunciations. So it's, it's kind of funny. But anyway, so just want to mention that. Uh, OK, so now. Uh, to deploy our application, uh, we're going to use a deployment file, right? Uh, and essentially, this deployment file, and let me show you how it looks like. So, like I said, you know, it's the kind of deployment. We want to create this deployment in our uh, IMDB namespace, and this deployment is going to reference uh, this image. Uh, right now, we're using GitHub Container Registry, but you can reference any uh, container registry that you like. Another popular one is Docker Hub. Uh, we're going to pass in a few arguments to our application. You know, we're saying that we want it to run in memory, and we're passing in the zone in the region, which is, in this case is dev. Uh, we're also passing in what port we want the container to run on. In this case, it's 8080. Uh, some probes to make sure that the application is up and, and healthy. And also some resource limits for that container. So to deploy that, we do it exactly the same way. So we do kubectl apply dash f 02 deploy so as you can see right away our application um, was our deployment was created and we can verify that by uh, doing kubectl get pods dash n imdb dash n means what uh, namespace we are referencing so in this case it's imdb and as you can see 20 seconds ago we have a pod of the name IMDB that was, was created. OK, cool. So our app is up and running. It's created. OK, well, so then let's, let's access it, right? So let's call this uh, endpoint. I'm using HTTP, HTTP PI, uh, which is an HTTP client. Uh, you can use curl if you choose to. We chose this one because it was just, you know, it's pretty easy to use and very uh, human readable. But if you choose to use curl, you can do that as well. So, OK, so let me copy paste this. Oh, by the way, if you get this message right here, uh, you just say allow. That way you can copy paste into the terminal. OK. So, oh no, it failed. We cannot access our application. This is expected to fail. The reason being is we don't have a um, service, right? So in, order, in Kubernetes, if you want to access your uh, application, you need to define a service. So for service, there's different things that you can create. Uh, one thing is you, know, you, you can create a cluster IP. Uh, you can create a node port. You can create a load balancer. Uh, in this case, we want to create a node port, uh, meaning that we want the endpoint to be exposed in our current node's um, uh, IP address. So in this case, we only have one node, so we have nothing to worry about. And let me show you how that looks like really quick. Uh, so again, we have a service, and it references the IMDB namespace, and we're targeting the port 8080. But on the node port, we're targeting port uh, 380. So likewise, we do kubectl apply dash f03 service, and uh, our service was created. So now, the same way we test the endpoint, we get a 200. Um, so that's good. So the, we have access to our um, application. So now, if I go to this link, Coral HTTP, essentially, uh, it's just an, it's a VS Code extension that allows you to hit different endpoints. But it's kind of useful if you want to test things. Uh, so in this case, for example, like I want to see my Prometheus metrics. So if I just click on Send Request, you can see that you know the response here on the right. Or for example, if you want to query all our actors, you can see here uh, 50 cents is there. Um, or like movies, for example. OK, so it's working, right? Like everything is good. Everything is great. Um, so, so that's great. Um, 
Oh, and one last thing. I know earlier I talked about uh, port forwarding. So um, we do have port forwarding by default. So if I go under ports, and if I click on IMDB app, you see this little globe icon. It's going to create a port forward for me automatically. And I can access the Swagger uh, docs for that application. I'm just going to try it out. And it's all good. You can press execute. Oh, execute. Thank you. OK. So again, um, this is a very, very basic Kubernetes deployment. I mean, obviously, there's a lot more to Kubernetes than this. I mean, we are at a conference of Kubernetes. Um, but the goal here is to show you, you know, what's like the, like the basic on how you do a deployment. Uh, in a little bit, Tiffany is going to be talking about uh, GitOps and how we can uh, scale this up, right? Imagine you don't have one app. What if you have 100 apps, right? Uh, what if you don't have one environment? Right now, it's just dev, right? What if you have pre-prod and prod and tests? And uh, what if you have 100 clusters, right? So how can we uh, scale this up? So Tiffany will be showing that in a little bit. Um, so the last thing I want to do, uh, I'm going to clean up the, deployments that I, the deployment that I just did. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to delete the service. So kubectl delete service imdb dash n imdb. Oh, did you mean delete? Yes, I meant delete. OK. Um, but the pod, even though I delete the service, the pod is still there. So we need to, you know, you might think, OK, well, I need, I need to delete the, the pod, right? So let me show you something right, really quick. So if I do kubectl delete pod, and then I'm going to copy paste my pod name, dash n imdb. Again, I cannot type today. Sorry about that. OK. So great, our pod is deleted, right? So we might think, OK, we're done. Our application has been deleted. Well, that's not the case. If I do uh, get pods, you can see that a new pod was created 11 seconds ago. This is because uh, the pods are managed by the deployment, right? So the deployment is making sure that you, know, you have a pod based on whatever description you have defined in your deployment. So if you, lead, if you delete the pod, the deployment is going to recreate it for you automatically. So if you really want to delete the application, then you have to delete, delete the deployment. So uh, you can also do this, kubectl delete dash f, and then you can reference the file name that you use to, to deploy it, right? So I'm going to do that. Our application is deleted. If I do kubectl get pods, you're going to see that the pod is being terminated, terminated, and now it's gone. Um, same way, I'm going to delete the namespace. OK, so that's the first portion of this demo. You know, like I said, I walk you through how to do a manual deployment of Kubernetes, a Kubernetes application. But now it's going to get pretty interesting. So now Tiffany is going to show you how we can achieve something very similar using GitOps. So Tiffany, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Joaquin. Um, and actually, before we get started, um, if you wouldn't mind um, creating a branch um, for today's workshop. We're each going to be creating a branch that is unique to our username, as well as it's appended with a random set of characters at the end. Um, and we're going to check out that branch and push it up. And we're going to change directory back to the root of our repository. Now, Flux has already been installed on your cluster, and so you can do a check of the Flux resources by running Flux check. The Flux CLI has been included within the code space, so that's how we're able to use Flux CLI commands. Great. We're looking for um, all checks passing successfully. Um, and as Joaquin mentioned, you know, you can absolutely deploy things manually to a Kubernetes cluster, but when it comes to um, being able to reproduce the state of your cluster, you need a way to um, easily get back to your desired state. Um, and as Joaquin mentioned, um, we have some manifests that are already included in this repository. 
Now, Flux has already been installed in the cluster, and what this means is that the Flux runtime components, like the controllers, the CRDs, are all up and running in the cluster. However, we want, Flux, we want to point Flux to our Git repository, our branch, and a path within that Git repository. So we can do that very simply by running the flux bootstrap git command. Um, and if you just copy and paste this block, we'll give that a minute to run. And um, I'll go through the significance of each of these arguments that you pass in. The URL um, signifies the URL uh, of the Git repository, which is in the Kubernetes 101 organization, the KubeCon 2022 repository. And we're passing in the branch variable that we just exported in the previous set of commands. We're specifying token auth. And what this does is tell Flux that we want to um, use a GitHub token um, and conduct basic auth to be able to allow Flux to read from the specified Git repository. We're also passing in a path. And this path is used in the Flux customization telling Flux to add its installation manifests and the sync file to the designated path. So, great. Um, if you've run the bootstrap git command successfully, we can next pull to get the latest contents from git, and you'll see, sorry, from that Flux made to the repository on our behalf, um, and you'll see a few files that got added. They include the GOTK components YAML, the GOTK sync YAML, and a customization YAML. GOTK stands for GitOps Toolkit, um, and we'll go into more depth about each one of those files in just a minute. Aha, so there's lots that has been going on, but the latest two commits on my branch that you can see are um, Flux adding the component manifests as well as the Flux sync manifests. So now what we can do is take a look at the Flux resources that got created for us. And we can do that by getting Flux get all. And by default, the namespace um, is Flux system. Um, for resources in other namespaces, you can pass in the namespace argument. So we see that we have two Flux resources, the Git repository and the customization. You'll see that the revision includes the name of your branch as well as the latest commit on your branch. So 3b5c, 3b5c, and more. <laughs> um, and we can see that both the Git repository and the customization are reporting as ready. In the readme, I've added some uh, comments to explain um, how the values got passed in um, to create the Git repository and customization pair that lets Flux know, look in this repository and this path within this repository. So that's great. We have Flux set up and we've pulled down the latest um, commits that Flux made to our repository, um, and the GOTK components includes all of the Flux runtime resources, and the GOTK sync um, includes the Git repository and customization, and there is also a customization YAML, and I want to point out that this is not a Flux customization resource. This is a customized overlay. Um, and as its name suggests, the Customize controller works with Customize, which is a configuration customization tool native to Kubernetes as of 114 that allows you to do some, uh, that allows you to keep your repositories very dry. Um, and if you're just using plain Kubernetes manifests like we are today, the Customize controller will add a customization YAML by default. And this is slow to load. Yes, I don't want to. Yeah. yeah, so I'm just going to use this. So now that we have Flux pointed at this repository, um, you might have noticed that the path was very specific to the deploy slash bootstrap directory. Now, this means that Flux is only monitoring this repository right now. But we have other resources that we'd like to deploy to our cluster, including the contents of the application directory 
and the contents of the observability directory. So what we can do is create a Flux customization to tell Flux to monitor and pull resources and reconcile those resources from our deploy slash application and deploy slash observability directories. We can very easily just um, run this command and Flux will create the customization and begin the reconciliation process. We want, to conduct, we want to make sure that we're adhering to GitOps principles. So instead, what we're going to do is export the contents of that customization. And in a second, here we go. We've now created a customization resource, placed it in the, repos in the location that Flux is already monitoring. And so what we can do is simply add, commit, and push our latest change. Great. So right now, the sync interval that we've set on the Git repository is set to one minute, and the customization sync interval is set to 10 minutes. We can trigger an automatic reconciliation using the Flux CLI, and we can do something like Flux reconcile source Git, and subsequently running a Flux reconcile, reconcile on the customization. Great. So these are showing as successful, and what we can do is take a look to see how the customization that we've just added is doing. And this, uh, uh, this uh, unready customization is actually an indication of success in our part on, uh, in, uh, for this purpose. And this is telling you that the application customization is failing because the observability customization is not ready. If you look closely, um, in the application customization, we added a field called depends on. Now, this depends on field um, tells the customized controller not to reconcile the contents of this customization until the dependency is ready. So in this way, Flux natively supports ordered installation of manifests. So let's go ahead and add the um, observability customization in the same exact way that we did for the application one. This time, we don't have a depends on. We're just going to um, add, commit, and push the observability customization. Great. Now, Previously, we did a reconciliation um, of both the source and the, sorry, the, the Git repository and the customization. But you can do both in one command by passing in the with source argument. So what this will do is first reconcile the source. So tells, this tells Flux to pull the latest contents from the source um, uh, repository, and then subsequently to reconcile the customization. Um, so I might have taken too long and Flux might have beaten me to it. Ah, okay, so if I had been a little bit quicker, you would have seen um, for about a minute or so that the application one might have reported as unready because the observability um, would have taken a little bit to come up. But we can see now that the observability and application customizations have both successfully reconciled. So. It's great that these Flux resources are reporting as ready, but what does this actually look like within the cluster, and what have we deployed? In the first part of this, this workshop, um, Joaquin deployed a deployment for the IMDB application, um, and he also deployed a service. This IMDB YAML includes both the deployment and the service, and we also have a WebV heartbeat, heartbeat and WebV uh, deployment, which allows us to run load tests later on in the workshop. We've also deployed the observability stack, including Fluentbit, Grafana, and Prometheus. And all of the resources that it takes to uh, deploy and configure your observability stack are expressed declaratively, including your Grafana dashboards, um, in, um, which are stored in config maps. So um, now what we can do is take a look at all, whoops, all of the resources. 
within the cluster now, and we'd expect to see some resources running in the logging namespace, the monitoring namespace, the IMD, IMDB namespace, and did I say monitoring? Already. <laughs> the heartbeat namespace as well. So all of our resources are up and running. Give me one second. So we've verified that we have all of our pods up and running. And Flux is also capable of detecting drift between what you've defined as your desired state in Git and the running cluster. So we saw that if you deleted a pod, the deployment would bring it back, um, and Kubernetes would do that by default. We also saw that if you deleted a deployment, the pod would no longer come back. So what we've done now is pointed Flux to a repository that includes that deployment definition. So what we can do is um, run a kubectl delete deployment for our IMDB um, deployment, and we can put a watch on getting the deployment. Now, this can take a few seconds, um, but effectively what, we're, what we will see um, is the fact that Flux is going to bring back the deployment on its next reconciliation loop. Ah, great. So we see that it's coming up now, and in a few minutes, ah, well, not minutes, it's there. Um, we see that one out of one containers are ready for the IMDB application. We can further verify by taking a look at the pods. Great. So Flux also detects drift um, within the resources that you've defined in Git. So this command here is going to describe the deployment that we've defined in Git. And just to show you the replicas field, um, oh, sorry, we have specified that we want one pod uh, running for the IMDB deployment. And we can show you, I can show you that here as well. Great. So what we can do is manually edit this deployment. And we can do that um, several different ways. Um, if you want to follow along with the workshop, you can export a cube editor environment variable. And by pasting that in, we can specify that we want to edit in VS Code. We can subsequently run a kubectl edit command, and that'll bring up the existing resource, um, and you can edit this file. And as long as the valid, uh, sorry, as long as the YAML is valid, it should save and automatically apply that change. Great. So I'll be quick here because I'm competing with Flux now. Awesome. So we see that the replicas um, has been updated to two, and great. Um, we can see that we have two pods running, um, which is what we've manually edited the deployment to show. Now, um, once we wait about a minute or so, what Flux should do is, reckon, is realize that the replica count um, in the deployment no longer matches what you've defined as your desired state. And so you can see now that the second pod is now being terminated now has been terminated, um, and we can take a look at the pods within the IMDB namespace. Great, we see one. If we hit up arrow a few times, we can see that the replica uh, field within the deployment has also been changed back by Flux. So, yeah, um, Flux, now we've deployed the sample application the observability stack, as well as um, checked out some of Flux drift detection and reconciliation capabilities. And I'll hand over to Joaquin for the um, observability section. Thank you. Okay, so Tiffany already got the applications uh, deployed. Uh, one way to verify, you know, deployments and everything, it's one of my favorite tools uh, is uh, canines. So essentially canines is a UI uh, tool that runs in the terminal and it allows you to inspect and you know, see what's going on with different Kubernetes resources. So um, in order to get started with canines, all you have to do is just type canines on your command line. And if you press zero, you're gonna see all the namespaces. 
Um, so as you can see here, we have different pods across all namespaces. And the first thing I'm going to do is I want to check this uh, WebV heartbeat. Uh, if you press L, it's going to pull out the, the logs. So as you can see that it's making a, a request around every five seconds. Uh, and likewise, I can open up my uh, WebV IMDB pod. And if I press L, you can see that it's sending around uh, 10 requests per, per second. Right. Likewise, on uh, canines, uh, you can see different types of resources, not just pods. Right. If I do uh, shift colon, and if I just type, for example, deployment, you can see that we have all these deployments already in the cluster. Um, I can do, let's see, secret, for example. Different secrets are defined, uh, et cetera. So, Pretty useful tool, um, highly recommend, uh, if you, especially if you're new to Kubernetes, um, it, you know, it's, it's great. Now, uh, the first component that I want to show uh, is Fluentbit, right? Uh, so Fluentbit, uh, it's a log processor and forwarder that allows you to collect log events from different sources and deliver them to different backends, right? So for this example, uh, essentially we're collecting logs from our application. But we're not really forwarding to any cloud provider. Right now, we're just uh, pushing it to standard out, just for the terms of simplicity. But should you choose to, uh, there's different connectors that you can use in Fluentbit in order to push you know, your logs to you know, um, you know, Azure, Google, et cetera, um, should you choose to. Uh, so all I wanted to really show uh, from Fluentbit, uh, let me go to pods. And if I just go under Fluent Bit, and if I press L, and then I can do, let's see, W for, um, for, the, the, for the wrap. And as you can see, like all these logs are the ones that are getting printed to standard out. Uh, like I said, you can configure it the way, whatever way you choose um, to whatever provider you want to use as well. Now, the next thing that is actually pretty cool that I want to show is uh, Prometheus. So like Tiffany mentioned on the slides, uh, Prometheus is a metrics collection and alerting tool. Uh, it records real-time metrics in a time series database, and it's built using an HTTP uh, pool model. Right, so as part of uh, Tiffany's demo, she already uh, deployed uh, Prometheus. So I can show you that we have it right here. The pod is running. And I'm able to access the uh, Prometheus UI if I click on ports. Prometheus, you see the little globe icon here. And we're going to port forward to our Prometheus UI. Um, it's coming up. It's coming up. Let me try again. Great. Remember we saw that last time? Refresh, maybe? Yeah, let's refresh really quick. Oh, it's, oh not this. The, the Prometheus tab. Hmm. Um, hmm, interesting. Are we losing Wi-Fi? I mean, we're plugged in now. I mean, let's see. Ethernet. Yeah, refresh that. Okay, I'm gonna refresh my code space really quick. Okay. Okay. Yes, okay. Ports. Prometheus. Okay, it's not showing. <laughs> Do you want to try? Yeah, try it. Oh, it's running. It might it's just running. Be slow. It's just just thinking. Yeah. Um, out of curiosity, is anybody was it anybody able to start up their code space and uh, cool? Oh yay! Okay, that's awesome. All right. This is doing the same for Grafana. Uh -huh. Okay, so it must be something. Yeah, I don't know try why it's timing. It. Let me try it again one more time. Yep. Yeah. yeah Okay, there you go, Prometheus is here, awesome. Okay, so this is how the Prometheus UI looks like. Um, I'm not gonna go too much detail given the time now, but 
Uh, a few things that I want to show. Uh, so if I, you go under status and then targets, uh, it will show you what targets Prometheus is currently uh, scraping. So for example, like our IMDB app that we showed before, uh, it has a metrics endpoint. So this is one of them that you know, Prometheus is scraping and you can see the status set to up. And then as well, we have some uh, for our uh, load testing, which is like the WebV uh, applications. So everything seems to be good. Um, so if I go back to the main UI, and you see this little icon right here? If you just press there, it will show you what are the metrics that Prometheus has been able to uh, scrape for us, and it's stored in the database. So um, for example, this one, um, you know, it shows there. Uh, so, yeah, so we have the metrics, cool, but we want to make it pretty. We want to be able to make it more like user friendly, right? So, for that, we have Grafana. And uh, Grafana is an open source observability platform that allows you to visualize metrics, logs, and traces uh, from your application. So, um, so, yeah, so you open the Grafana uh, port, and the user and password is admin and then KubeCon 101. It's also in the, in the readme. So I'm already logged in. This is Grafana. Uh, the first thing I want to show you, if you go under uh, the little uh, gear, bar, gear tool icon and then press uh, data sources. So Grafana can connect to many different data sources. Um, for this case, right now, we're just connecting to Prometheus. But I just wanted to show you that you have the capability of connecting to so many things. Uh, you can connect to Elasticsearch, you know, Grafana Tempo, um, Azure Monitor is there, Grafana Cloud, et cetera. So there's just so many options, so many, so many things out there. There's so many plugins out there that you can use. Uh, for today's demo, we're just focusing on Prometheus, but I just wanted to, like I said, mention that this exists, right? And you, you can play with it uh, should you choose to. So, okay, so we have a Prometheus uh, data source. Uh, is pointed to our Prometheus uh, service. Uh, if I click on save and test, we know that everything is connected as expected. And now if I go here, you can see that we have a dashboard for our IMDB uh, application, which keeps track of what, how many requests per second are coming into our application, and also how long the requests are taking and if there's any errors at the moment. So right now we have no errors and the requests seem to be pretty constant. Okay, great. So now we're gonna load, we're gonna run a load test uh, so that we can see some, some action here in Grafana. Uh, so to do that, we have some already pre-made tools to load uh, um, our load test. You don't have to worry about too much about what it does in the background. But all you have to do is just run this uh, KIC, which stands for Kubernetes and Codespaces, test load. Let me quit from here. And I want to run a few integration tests. Actually, I want to run them all at once. And the reason being is I want things to fail uh, on purpose. That way we can see some of those errors in, um, in Grafana, right? So I'm just going to run it a few times. I'm gonna hit it a few more times. So, okay. So now if I go back to Grafana, you can see that our load starts to go up, right? We have more requests coming in per, per second. Um, and then in a little bit, just give it a few seconds. Oh, there you go. You're gonna start seeing that we have some errors in our um, endpoints as we expected. You can see that the uh, request per second also went up. Now we're in on orange. Um, so yeah, so um, very useful, very valuable. Uh, you can do so many things with it. Um, if you haven't used Grafana, I, you know, we highly recommend it. Um, okay, so I think that's it in terms of uh, demo. Uh, if you have a code space still running, um, you can stop it by pressing this little code space uh, button down here. And then you can see um, stop current code space. Um, we're gonna leave this access open for you know maybe like another few days because I know not everybody was able to get the access today. 
Uh, that way you can test this back at your hotel or back at home. But that being said, I want to turn it back to Tiffany, who's going to uh, show us some slides. Great. So unfortunately, only a handful of you were able to um, you know, conduct uh, the hands-on portion alongside with us. But today, we've covered Kubernetes, GitOps, and observability. We've deployed a sample application via Flux in our Kubernetes cluster, um, as well as the observability stack following a GitOps workflow. We've also monitored that sample application and even ran some integration and load tests to simulate application use and success, successful and failed traffic. Um, we have just a few minutes um, and I'll just um, mention very briefly that Joaquin and I will be here for the rest of KubeCon Cloud Native Con um, and you can find us at several booths um, including the Microsoft Azure booth, um, there's a Flux booth as well, and a WeWorks booth. Um, and in this deck, we've included some additional resources for the topics that we've covered today. Um, so I just wanted to get that out of the way so that we can use the rest of the time for any questions that might have been asked. Yeah, sounds good. Can we take a selfie really quick? Yeah. <laughs> Are you okay if we take a selfie? <laughs> no. Yeah. Let's do it really quick. Okay, Thank cool, you. so let's okay. do the Q&A then. Q&A. Um, I think that there will be a microphone that will get placed in the center aisle um, if you had any questions. And thank you all again so much for your patience. Um, really appreciate it. There's, a, There's a, microphone. a microphone back there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> shall, I, shall I stay here? Or? Um, okay. Wherever you're comfortable. Okay. Uh, I have a question regarding the Flex. What's the uh, similarity between Helm and Flex? Ah, that's a great question. Um, and Helm is actually a great templating tool that's you know cloud native and allows you to package up all of your resources. Um, so uh, Flux and Helm are different, I would say. Um, Helm does include some um, CLI commands that allow you to you know do things like Helm install, Helm upgrade, you know, etc. Um, but what Flux um, adds to that is the ability to declaratively define Helm resources that live in Git that the Flux Helm controller manages. So um, I might have mentioned during the talk that the customized controller is one of Flux's reconciler controllers, and Flux's Helm controller is the other reconciler controller, and it interacts with a Helm release, which defines a Helm chart from a Helm repository that Flux then uses um, to do something, to do, you know, installations and upgrades. Um, but instead of you having to manually call Helm install or Helm upgrade, um, you just add it to Git, make sure that it's in a repository that Flux is monitoring, and Flux can um, perform the installations and upgrades on your behalf. And you can define um, values either within the Helm release um, so, some, so similarly to passing in a values YAML to any Helm commands um, or, you know, setting any values. Um, and you can define those within the Helm release itself or externally in a config map that you subsequently feed into the Helm release. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. So in other words, it's like automation between repository and deployment process. So it's like another layer over the uh, uh, Helm. Right. So just the link between Git or repository and the deployment process in the Kubernetes. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, would you mind passing the microphone? Uh, thank you so much for a great demo. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And having all the patience amidst all the Wi-Fi issues. Uh, <laughs> we I appreciate two, you for that. <laughs> I have two questions. Um, 
One, how do you manage uh, secrets? Uh, we have an issue with continuous uh, cycling of tokens and managing it. How do you manage uh, secrets? Second, what other competitive products exist or equivalent for Flux, like in the, in the same uh, space as Flux, what it does? Thank you. Yep. So secrets is a great question. Um, and I mentioned, I mean, and one of the GitOps principles is that all of your all of the things that you intend to deploy to your cluster should be defined in Git. However, Kubernetes secrets are you know, only Base64 encoded and effectively plain text. So in that case, there are a lot of different options for secrets management. Um, if you, you know, are looking at um, like open source tooling, there's the sealed secrets controller, um, which, which includes a, an encryption key um, that it only lives within the uh, secrets, sealed secrets controller. Um, so if you store the secret in Git, um, it's, it's no longer a plain text secret effectively. You can also use, um, and Flux now natively supports vault integration um, as well as SOPs. So those are some other options. And I believe that your, third, your second question was um, other options um, uh, um, apart from Flux. And I did mention that GitOps itself is agnostic to tooling. Um, and so there's um, a, a few others uh, that are available. Um, and I think that you'll be able to find some talks on those as well at uh, KubeCon. So I would invite you to. I appreciate if you can name a few so that I can go and read about those. Uh. Got it. Um, Argo comes to mind. Yeah, um, I think Argo with uh, HelloFresh and Flux. Yeah. Um, what other ones are out there? Um, um, yeah, sorry, I didn't come prepared with a list of sure, <laughs> other alternatives. Apologies. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, um, I will just briefly ask, uh, since you mentioned Argo, uh, which is another uh, continuous delivery tool, for GitOps as well. So, uh, although I'm not experienced with it, so uh, I, I, I want to ask that, um, what do you find the key differences between Flux and Argo, or what strengths do you find in uh, Flux uh, that you might want to choose over Argo CD? Yeah, Thank you. That's a great question, and I will be the first to admit that I am not, you know, supremely well versed in Argo. But from Flux's perspective, um, some of the benefits include the fact that it leverages a lot of native Kubernetes functionality, include, including things like role-based access control. And Flux um, natively supports multi-tenancy within a cluster. Um, and while the Flux reconciler, can, while Flux might have widespread access within your cluster, you can specify that when Flux is reconciling contents of a customization, perhaps from a you know, an application team's repository, you can lock it down by defining um, roles or and role bindings to attach the service account for that application team, shall we say. And what that will allow Flux to do is only deploy and reconcile resources that are allowed in the RBAC rules. Um, you can similarly define a cluster role and cluster role, role binding if there are cluster scoped resources that that application team might need to deploy. Um, and Flux also scales really well um, and is able to manage, I don't know, yeah. a and big also, number and, of clusters, and thousands. There, there'll be vendors for both Flux and Argo right. um, at the boots, right? So you can always ask more questions in yeah. terms of the, the, exactly. you know, the similarities you. and differences, yeah, so. Yeah, um, yes, please feel free to come find us at um, the booths and happy to chat further. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Oh. Uh, in the back there. Thank you. Hi, right, thank you so much for the talk. Um, my quick question was around monitoring and observability. Um, I know that's not the point of this talk, but uh, I want to get your thoughts around um, using the open source tools like Prometheus versus like third party tools, maybe like Datadog and other such. Wondering what your thoughts around like you know the pros of using the native open source tools versus others. Well, 
Um, how deep are your pockets? <laughs> um, I, I only say that to, as a joke, but um, I would say that if you are beginning, um, you know, testing out and um, figuring out what metrics it is you're interested in collecting, um, as well as carving out, you know, and, and creating specific alerting around specific metrics um, and gathering information about the uh, general performance of your cluster, open source is a really great way to start. Um, and I know that, you, I think you mentioned Datadog. Um, there are a lot of additional capabilities that um, you can have vendor support for. Um, but I would say that the open source community is um, quite generous with their knowledge. Um, and you'll find a lot of um, examples um, and, and um, like resources, resources yeah. online as well. So um, they are battle tested. Um, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, quick yes? One. Quick. Um, that KAC load test tool, is that something you created yourselves? Yeah, it's like a little tool, grid in and go, that allows you just to automate. It's essentially, um, just in the background, it just runs a bunch of uh, bash, bash scripts just to make it a little easier for us. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And you can actually see the contents of the load test and the um, integration tests um, in the repository itself. Um, I think it's under the .kic directory. Oh, I think that got or, refactored. Oh, it got refactored. Okay. Yeah. But uh, if you want to contact me, I, I can, you know, I, I can point you in that direction. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Cool. Um, I guess uh, this isn't the last opportunity to chat with us. Um, thank you again so much for your patience and for joining our session today. Yeah, thank really you. Really appreciate it.